Okay, so welcome to the Planners on Purpose podcast. Um, my name is Naomi Tucker, and I'm your host today. And I have something special for you today. We have Ashanti, um, who runs Event Mine Digital um, and a digital event delivery partner. And she's also the co founder of Events and Diversity, Black and Events and Diversity Ally. So, welcome, Ashanti. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have another chat with you. Yes, yes, um, and thank you so much for just being, um, this has been a long time coming, so I'm <laughs> really excited to be able to have this interview, and um, just thank you for, for everything um, being so flexible, and I'm just excited to get into our conversation today, because we had such a great one um, before this. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted you to be able to tell um, my listeners about Black and about yourself, um, can you tell me a little bit more about you and what you do? You seem to have a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really quite funny, you know, I get that all the time. People are like, you do so much. And really, I only really work on two things, principally. Okay. And, and most of the time, 99% of the time, it's the same. They, they really do merge into the same thing. So um, I run a digital event company. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing that for five years. And um, obviously my experience was that I would often be the only person of color, the only woman of color, the only yeah. black woman in the room. Whenever mm -hmm. I went to trade shows, conferences, anything related to the business, I was the only one. And so I knew why that was, mm -hmm. um, but it had always been very important to me to encourage other people to get into the industry but also in a way you take on a bit of a responsibility for being one of the few um, by, you know, making sure that you always over deliver. Right. As well. So there's that pressure, yeah, which I'm sure we'll get into. And that's just yeah. the reality, you know, of, of being in business. And so, um, but so by proxy, because I am a woman of colour, it always meant that in some way there was some kind of diversity in the room, even if the organiser, the platform or the network hadn't intended for that to be so. Mm -hmm. And I felt that we needed to do something more um, concerted, structured. Mm -hmm. And so that is how I started the Black and Events Network with my co-founder, Kenesha Williams, who's based in Canada. Um, we met ironically over Twitter and we bonded over the fact that we were one of a few and I said to her you know we should really do something about it she's like yeah we should and so we started the Black Events Network. I love those Twitter connections right? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly Twitter is incredible yeah. um, for that and great SEO by the way everyone um, if you're active on Twitter you'll get picked up in Google for all sorts of things, which is oh, that's good to handy. Know. Yes. <laughs> so if you're someone who's looking, you know, to get picked up for speaking opportunities or indeed marketing your business, mm -hmm. you know, Twitter comes up in a Google search also. Okay. So that's how the Black and Events Network started. Now, strategically speaking, it was important to separate Black and Events from Diversity Ally, which is my diversity and inclusion practice that I run with um, Gabby Brown, who's based in the UK here with me. Okay. And the reason for that is the reality is A, diversity and inclusion is such a broad topic. B, the events industry specifically and hospitality are really at the embryo stages of mm -hmm. understanding what this is, much less how to make the necessary um, changes in this area. And, and C, the reality is a lot of organizations are not quite there yet. And so when we were having conversations with organizations about black and events, it was a bit too much for them because they haven't really started that wider piece when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Okay. And so strategically we split those two things because mm -hmm. there's a time and a place where we see those brave organizations who want to specifically support black event professionals and suppliers. Mm -hmm. And then we see those organizations who are on the other end of the spectrum, or maybe they have other diversity threads mm -hmm. that they need to work on, who, you know, diversity ally is the more fitting partner for them. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So you're really just tackling both ends of the spectrum for where um, the yes. industry is looking um, for yeah. help. And so in Black and Events, it's more focused on the event industry. Is Diversity Ally focused on the event industry as well? Or is that yes. more broader? 
Okay. Yeah, so Diversity Ally is specifically for the events of the hospitality industry because they interlink so much. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, and, and before now, there wasn't really a, a, a you know, a platform that focused on diversity and inclusion within the events industry. You know, there are some unique things about the industry um, mm -hmm. that, you know, we we recognize. And so all of the resources that we create and, um, you know, share are specific for the events industry. Okay. So organizations like the National Association of Black Meeting Planners, how would you say that that would be different um, mm -hmm. from let's say these two um, other um, organizations that you're- Sure, so that's a really interesting question. I think that in many ways, certainly Black and Events is similar in the sense that it has a strong mission. Mm -hmm. It is unapologetic in that it is specifically about and for Black event professionals and suppliers, mm -hmm. and also it's community-based. So those are all the ways that we're similar. It's okay. all about community, peer-to-peer -peer support and progress. Mm -hmm. Where we slightly differ, um, Diversity Ally is, uh, provides consultancy in terms of, you know, organizations, okay? Mm -hmm. How can organizations from leadership processes, systems and procedures mm -hmm. become more diverse and inclusive, which is slightly different to providing maybe platform and network and community spaces mm -hmm. for black event professionals? Right, and I see that being needed so so very much because it's not just about you know representation. A lot of people feel as though like okay, as long as I represent, as long as I have let's say um, a person of color on you know my team, then I check, <laughs> I got that checked off the list. But it's so much more than that, right? It is, and it's funny actually. I've had some really interesting conversations just this week with clients, and mm -hmm. it's helping organisations to understand that it's as much the mindset approach and the way of doing things mm -hmm. that matters. Okay, that is the piece that needs to be worked on first, and that is the piece that over time you're able to see results on. So what mm -hmm. tends to happen, I think, is because maybe we're events people, we're used to checklists and manuals and tasks. And so we are very solution and fix it focused, whereas this isn't a topic that you can take that approach to. Mm -hmm. It's about changing attitudes, ideas, beliefs and ways of doing things. Um, and so, for example, it's funny, I was having a conversation with an organization who's very much in the events industry and, and they were saying look you know we have when we have like at times like this to hire quickly mm. we do automatically go to people that we've worked with over many years because we know how much they charge and we don't have to onboard them in terms of the company ways of doing things mm. and so they were saying you know how can we change that and i was saying look you know the point is if you got to that decision in an ethical and diverse way, then that is the outcome. What we're trying to help organizations do though, is make sure the way they make these decisions are ethical and diverse and inclusive. And so it may be that once you've created recruitment practices that are more diverse and inclusive, that for that particular post, you end up hiring someone who may be, I don't know, cis, heterosexual, white and male, but that's okay in that instance because the way you got to the decision was more diverse and healthier um of course over time if you're doing if you're practicing this kind of diverse recruitment your recruitment should look representative representative over a period of time yeah absolutely and i i agree with that and i love what you said changing the mindset because i feel like every decision that's made in an organization has to be built on a foundation um of inclusivity right um so as long as you are thinking of everyone in your company having everyone in mind having everyone externally in mind like your clients and your yes. clients have to be diverse too like right um so it's just what you would need to do. So I totally yeah. agree that you have to work with them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think also it's like, you know, you know, look, if it's something you've never done before, it takes effort. And seriously, you can see the wheels turning in people's heads because it now requires effort and conscious thought. And that isn't easy. And so we're there really to provide some safety while they work through, okay, what do we need to do now? What does change behavior look like? How you know, how do we get the buy-in from everybody to even make these changes? You know, it's not easy work. 
that's one thing it's not. It's, <laughs> it can be quite challenging for organisations to be brave enough to say, okay, we don't quite, we haven't really got this right yet. And we need to learn and we need to listen to our employees mm -hmm. and then make decisions moving forward based on that. Right. Can you talk about like the concept of that with entrepreneurs and with building up a brand new, you know, a, a new company? Yes. Um, well, sometimes it's very natural for people to say, I'm building this new company and thus I'm going to go with, like you mentioned, people that I know, people that um, are in my network. But typically the people that are in their network um, all look like them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's hard. Is 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 that a good place to start, or should these entrepreneurs be actively seeking um, a more inclusive, I guess, foundation? Mm, that's a really good question. I think again, it's quite challenging because I know what it's like to start businesses, and oh, you do look within your network first of all. You know, uh, you know, if you need a website built, you'll think of someone who you know who builds websites. If you need food you'll think of who do I know who runs a catering company it's quite natural to do that as an individual starting a privately owned business I think there's two things you know unfortunately the level of consciousness and balancing that with commercialism is very individual I can definitely say as an individual um, I am very conscious of the suppliers that I use in my business, people that I work with. And that does present me with challenges because it does mean sometimes, whereas I could just drop in a message on LinkedIn, for example, and say, hey, we're looking for a project manager for a six week project. I know I'd get replies, but I also know that it's very unlikely that those replies will come from a diverse pool of people. I also know that, right? And so that means that where it might take me an hour to get three people to email me and start those conversations, it could take me a day or two if yeah. I want more diverse, you know, partners. Mm -hmm. Right? So I get it. It's hard when you've got time pressure, money pressure. Um, make quick decisions. Things happen that way sometimes. Exactly. But one thing I will say is that now that I, so when I look maybe further down the line at the six month projects, the 12 month projects, now's the time where I have a chance because I have a bit more time. I can think about how I work with more diverse suppliers. So mm -hmm. it is very challenging as an individual to do. And I think everyone's level of consciousness plus always balancing that commercial lens that you have to have when you're starting and running a business is a challenge. But what we do see is when privately founded businesses get to a stage of around 10 people, mm. this is where we see they have those opportunities to really start thinking about their diversity and inclusion values. Okay. Okay. So I'm here, you know, you have some, you have some bandwidth there if, yes. you know, just being uh, to know about it and yeah. uh, maybe you can come back to that a little later. Um, right. Really, an entrepreneur is trying to get up and running as soon as <laughs> the resources that they have. So exactly, yes. Yeah. So you know, we have to give grace for that. I think it's just a reality that you doesn't matter how much you uh, talk about. The fact of the matter is, when you're first starting a business, you're just trying to get your clients delivered to clients and so forth. But what we see typically is around ten employees. You'll see organisations start to think about culture and their people. They'll start to think about talent development. They'll start to think about policies and all of those things that is a great time at which you can start thinking about diversity and inclusion oh great great that's some some gems there thank you so much because i know there's many entrepreneurs that people that are starting up in this space due to um what's going on right now and i wanted to switch gears a little bit into some of that so right now we're going through a global pandemic there's also so much civil unrest um, focusing around the injustices in the black community. And it's not just um, in the US, it's everywhere. So this ends up being more of a double impact um, for the black community. But how do you recommend the events industry and organizations within the events industry position themselves between these two very big challenges that, you know, that affect these communities? Absolutely. So I think for, they're under major pressure at the moment. Every business is, you know, um, and in many ways, again, it goes back to what I said about the balance of consciousness and commercials. COVID will be pressuring their commercials. 
and then you add in the mix of you know the black lives matter movement and spotlight at the moment and then the consciousness is also being pressured uh you know, from an organizational point of view, the first thing I always say is you need to talk to your employees. You know, don't make assumptions, don't guess. Talk to your employees. And, you know, you have to create um, discrete channels of communication. Doing a big, massive town hall probably isn't the best way unless you have a very good culture existing in your organization. Because what happens is people don't always share what they're honestly thinking because they're afraid of repercussions. This is the bottom line. So the first thing I'd say for organizations, if you feel like you're in between a rock and a hard place right now, is to actually speak to your employees and you know, provide discrete channels, maybe an anonymous independent survey of some kind and ask your employees how they're feeling, where they're at and what they'd like to see improve. That's the first step that I think an, uh, an organization can take. Yes, and um, so what what would you say to those um, individuals and even some business owners that are really intimidated about having that conversation? Some people that I've talked to really don't know how to have it. I love the idea of an anonymous survey, right? Because it kind of puts them out of it. How would they have that conversation? Yeah, sure. So yeah, the how is really interesting because we're all used to talking, <laughs> but we're not necessarily used to um, having a conversation that is productive, uh, especially about race in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So holistically speaking, I'd say engage an external facilitator. Mm -hmm. The reasons for that are this, you know, on a day to day basis, you work with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. If you're in a leadership position or a manager, there's another dynamic at play anyway. So suddenly for the first time, maybe you're asking your colleagues and peers how they really feel about yeah. something that could be quite emotional, very personal. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always yield the best results. When you ex engage an external um, facilitator, they act as a shock absorber. And also they don't have to, um, or they have skilled ways of navigating office dynamics and politics as well. Mm -hmm. And that also allows you as a manager, a leader, as a peer, as a colleague, to also experience what's happening as opposed to have to coordinate chair or facilitate that conversation so i would say holistically speaking it's always best to engage an external facilitator so that you get better results and that hopefully that improves those chances of your employees opening up about how they feel and what it is that they want that's the first thing secondly hopefully that external facilitator um, is able to work on a framework for uncomfortable conversations, for having uncomfortable conversations. And this is a really interesting area and a really interesting question because ironically, we're not good at having uncomfortable conversations in the workplace about anything, pay rises. <laughs> you have to, you know, I don't know, sack someone, you know, disciplinaries, grievances. We're not good at it anyway. And then you add in the mix of talking about race. If you don't have the skills and the language and the emotional intelligence even mm -hmm. to have a conversation like that where people can come away feeling valued, mm -hmm. understood, heard, it's a real challenge. Yeah, and what are the pros and cons of, because what I've also seen is um, little committees, right? Diversity committees, okay. Maybe they don't go out to get an inclusion specialist, but we're just going to put people together to, um, to have a committee. And I mean, it's a good thing, but what are the pros and cons of having that committee? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so here's the thing, you know, it's, it's like, trying to plant a fresh rose in yeah. dry soil right yeah it's not gonna look it's not gonna do anything right but you know because you're taking the same people now here, and here's the thing it's totally okay to feel interested in passionate about a topic that doesn't mean though that you should be the champion or the, the, um, the expert within your workplace though. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you're interested or passionate about something, maybe you can support, you can become an ally to that particular initiative, cause, et cetera. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you should actually be the stakeholder for that. And, and this is where creating these networking groups and forums and diversity committees 
you know, using the same people that were there before. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at those committees, there's no diversity in those committees either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is problematic. And essentially you're setting that committee up to fail as well. Because like I said, you haven't actually got the right soil mm -hmm. before you started to try and plant, yes. uh, you know, within it. So uh, I don't know whether it's pros and cons. I think they're a good idea when okay. you select them carefully when you provide adequate training and frameworks as well and when you also make an effort to ensure that they are diverse now if you are an organization that lacks diversity across any strata race sexuality etc etc engage an external facilitator because then you can have your committee with your employees but you have someone there steering them yes. in the right direction so that you don't set them up to fail and some of the other issues that sometimes organizations overlook mm -hmm. is that if you are going to be in a committee or a forum you have to build trust with everyone else you can't just keep it within that community exactly so there's that piece too and again sometimes and quite often we don't have the skills to influence other people we don't have the skills to have these uncomfortable conversations in productive ways yeah. we may not know how to gain and earn the respect and the trust of our colleagues we may not have had to do that before and just because you have a manager title it also doesn't mean that you have the respect and trust of your colleagues and so this is why they are they're always commendable things these committees but you also have to provide some support and framework around them yeah, I love what you said is that you need the skills to be able to influence. And then I always think of, okay, well, what are you influencing them to do? Do you yes. have that clear goal in mind on what are you doing? What are, how are you influencing them and what's the end goal? Um, because if that's not set and um, accurate, then you could be steering the whole organization into different places that you don't want. <laughs> precisely, precisely. So they are admirable, but you definitely need support mm -hmm. um, around making sure that they can be as successful as possible. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about that success. So we, you know, we have heard as a takeaway from a lot of what is happening, especially with injustices, um, people have taken the opportunity to listen and to learn, um, to listen to the voices of the community, to to hear them, to read books. So can you speak about what happens after? Because I feel like we probably are in that position of what do we do after we listen and after we learn? Sure. So at that point, it's about objectively, first of all, after the listening and learning stage, um, we then have to think as an organization about what we want to achieve. What does success look like for us? You know, some organizations, it will be their hiring and recruiting. Others, it might be diversifying the supply chain. And for others, it may just be more diverse and inclusive marketing. So it's about understanding actually what area you'd like to work on first. Mm -hmm. After that, it's again assessing what does success look like for us and then working back from that. What exact actions? which stakeholders do we need to activate? What do we need to invest to make sure we see progress in this area? It really is about engineering the results that we want to see and being willing to do the work and put the conscious effort in to get it done. And if someone wanted to, let's say, audit their organization, like you said, and to determine what they should focus on, what would you suggest they do with a continued work with an inclusion specialist how would they go about okay. yes yeah, sure i mean what we've done at diversity allies we created global benchmarks mm -hmm. for the events industry so leadership employees suppliers hiring marketing etc so you, they're absolutely free open and transparent so any organization if you work for an organization and you also think your organization can work on this go onto the website and look at those benchmarks and you'll be able to identify straight off the bat what areas you need to work in we've also provided some prompts under each benchmark questions that you can ask yourself about your organization that will reveal what areas you need to work on and then you can decide internally on which specific area you'll you'll tackle first yeah awesome well so so there are some 
good resources, it sounds like, over at Diversity Ally that everyone can go and check out. To yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they're free. <laughs> and they're absolutely free. free. So okay. you can't go wrong. You know, the podcast is free. The guide is free. The report is free. You know, it's great discreet ways of learning without anybody else knowing that that's what you're doing. <laughs> yes, okay. so it's, it's, it's useful. Perfect. Well, I just want to ask how um, has your race and ethnicity affected how you do business in the event? Woo! <laughs> I'm pretty sure it has. It has for me, but <laughs> woo! It's a bit of a Ric Flair. How, how long we got? You know. Um, <laughs> so I would say, as a business owner, oh my goodness! So one of the things I did was institute a sales team that did not look like me. Mm. So when I started to scale and grow, I made sure the sales team did not look like me. Okay, so it's all my direction, strategy, content, but the people that are seen, people who answer the phones, who reply to the emails first, don't look like me. And that has made a huge difference mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. That's the I, first thing. I mean, that's so, there's so much in that <laughs> to, to unpack. I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> the fact that um that let's say you would you would need to do that um really points to um where some of the needs are yes. perhaps in the industry yeah absolutely because you know yeah and there, there are some very real examples of situations where the same organization the same people have been approached uh, oh. by my business development team who don't look like me and the, 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 the response, the, the quality, the nature, and the pace of the response they've received versus when I've done it. Mm. Exact same content. Uh, so <laughs> wow. that's the first thing. Secondly, um, one thing it has obviously done is made me far more conscious about ensuring that our supply chain is diverse, our team is diverse as well. Mm -hmm. Right, there was a, the, you know, there was a time where potentially I could have been the only person of color in my team <laughs> because obviously I'd focused so much on making sure that my presence didn't negatively impact the growth of the business that I looked around and thought I haven't hired necessarily anybody who looks like me. And that's changed now, which is a good thing. And then also when it comes to our supply chain, I'm very clear. So we run a lot of events and that means that we hire suppliers along the way. And I'm often very clear, even with the partners, ships that I build, we're not going to just use your supply chain just because I want to see that list and I want to see how diverse it is. And if there are areas in which I can introduce new diverse suppliers, I will. And that can be challenging conversations because they're like, well, this is, we've worked with them for years. Yes. They give us preferential rates. It's like, I don't care because if we don't introduce some diversity into this supply chain, we won't have any. And for us as a business, that's not part of our values. So we that's will. So important. <laughs> it's so important and it's so commendable that you do that because that's the hard work that you're talking about um, yeah. is really having those conversations and um, making sure that you have that, you know, diverse hat on through yeah. all aspects of your business. So that's amazing that you're doing that. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, there were some hard days for me you know what it's like as an entrepreneur there's always ups and downs and you know there have been moments and days where my credibility has been challenged and i know it is exclusively because of my race mm -hmm. i know that because there aren't any more accolades or anything i could potentially earn or obtain at this point okay yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> You know, there's no more qualifications I can obtain to demonstrate that I know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. right? And so, and then there's also likability factor, and I'm always take that into account. So I think I probably have become a, a far, you know, I'm I'm comfortable using the word fat, but as a fat black woman, you know, you're used to being bubbly and cheerful and very peopley, right? Because all of these things buffer sometimes the dynamic that you find yourself in um to be less threatening less intimidating mm -hmm. um and, and 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 it's a bit of a, a an oxymoron because in this client service provider dynamic i should be the expert but i'm having to slightly dial that down to make 
the client feel comfortable. So it's, it's, there are <laughs> some challenges. And it's hard because then you're, you're diminishing yourself or the, the, I don't know, your best version of yourself. Absolutely. Your client because of their insecurities. And so it's like, can you imagine how much more value conversations can have and how much, I don't know, more value the industry could be if we are able to accept differences and yeah. right, have a diverse perspective. Um, and their science behind diverse teams are amazing and do better than non-diverse teams. So Yeah, right. exactly that, exactly that. And, and to your point, such a sadness because, mm -hmm. as I say, sometimes I look at clients and I think we could 10 times your results on that. Mm -hmm. But I know, I've tried, you're not going to take advice from me, no. you know, yeah. on this. Um, but you could really, you know, be well ahead of your competitors, mm -hmm. for example you could 10 times your ROI. Um, but, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, so despite a lot of the diversity work that I do, that doesn't necessarily change the on the ground experience mm. that I'm having as a business owner. So, so how do you, um, how, are you managing through those? I know you talked about you're dialing yourself back a little bit in certain conversations um, and trying to be more diverse about your team. Um, what other things are you doing to kind mm -hmm. of navigate those challenges in, in the workplace as well? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, honestly, sometimes from an emotional point of view, it's difficult because, you know, um, yeah. you're being asked to raise awareness about diversity. You're being asked to contribute on content about diversity. But you're still experiencing these channels as a business owner. Like there's, there's no. So sometimes, how I cope is just having a chat. <laughs> um, also recognizing that it's a journey, and not everybody is there yet. Not everybody's ready to take that journey yet. So managing my own expectations about the pace of change as well, in terms of the wider industry, um, and you know, above all. It, it's a given making sure that we are you know incredible at what we do because then at the end of the day we can't be challenged on that yeah absolutely absolutely so uh, well it's no doubt you're a very busy important woman with many accolades so if you could give our listeners some tips on how to manage how you manage your busy world <laughs> <laughs> honestly um oh tips <laughs> no, yeah. it's, do you know what it is, is that I've had to sit in the reality that things are unpredictable, things change, and just, you know, go with the change. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest tip. The more rigid you are mentally, um, mm -hmm. I think you struggle to meet the challenges of this current climate, especially if you're operating in the events industry or sphere. Mm -hmm. Practical things that I do, I rely on my calendar heavily. Um, I make to-do lists, so I have a today list, I have a tomorrow list, and I have the week list and the month list. Like I'm very much about task lists, um, yeah. so that I can look back and just really check where I'm at. Um, so those are the practical things I say is having an actual task list that I recognise will change and priorities will change in, and then mentally being prepared that things might change and not being you know too rigid right because then you can't act or move quickly enough when you need to okay. um that's what i would say and then i've gotten really good over the years you know <laughs> diversity work and events work is 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 requires you to navigate real human beings their emotions the things they might say you know you have to regulate your own emotions all of the time so i'm I'm probably quite good at that um, mm -hmm. because my job is to hold space whether for it be for a client with yeah. an event or a client that we're doing some kind of consultancy with. And mm -hmm. so that requires me to be able to regulate my own emotions and put them aside, separate them at times. And so that helps me when I'm under pressure. So that's the tips I would give is just try and be more organized in a way that suits you, whether it's pen to paper, which it is for me, or it's using an electronic calendar and also really work on preserving and protecting your emotions and your energy. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And I just based off of our conversation, I feel like we have, there's so much work to do. So I'm just so appreciative of you and of um, all of your partners that are taking up this diversity flag and um, definitely championing the industry with it. I'm so appreciative if there's anything that, you know, anyone here at Planners on Purpose can do to help with that. would love to do it because it's also um, a purpose of ours too for diversity and inclusion. So thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have any last words of advice or anything you would like to give the listeners of this podcast before we? I'm sure I've taught them all out. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ashanti. We will um, definitely um, speak to you soon. It was lovely to have you on the podcast. Okay.